grab some arrows, stock up on explosive shells, and keep your eyes peeled for floating triangles. It's time to hunt some freaking dinosaurs. Turok made quite the impression on N64 owners back when it first came out, giving players a fast-paced, carnage-filled first-person shooter experience, the likes of which had never been seen on a home console before. It's remained in many gamers' hearts in the decades since release, and I am often requested to take a look at it for this channel. And you know what? I think today is the day we cross this one off the list. What's up everybody? I'm Kirk, and today we are roaring into Turok Dinosaur Hunter Remastered for the PC. But before all that, please be sure to subscribe and ring that bell for more videos on video game fossils. Alrighty, let the hunt begin. Released back in 1997 for the Nintendo 64, Turok was developed by Iguana Entertainment and published by Acclaim. What you may or may not know about it is that the game was based on the long-running comic book series of the same name, which Acclaim bought the rights for in the mid-90s. Turok is a 90s shooter through and through. It's lightning fast with plenty of bone-crushing, gory violence. But what set Turok apart was its focus on more open, outdoor environments that gave the player the freedom to explore. It was also a fully 3D shooter in a time where fully 3D shooters were just getting their start. Quake had only been on PCs for a year by the time Turok was released, and the fact that the N64 could handle an experience similar to that was a pretty big deal. Not to mention the genre hadn't found its true footing on consoles yet. Keep in mind, Turok dropped six months before the release of GoldenEye 64. This, along with the fact that the N64 library was still pretty scant at the time, contributed to Turok's success as it was a critical and commercial hit. And I'm sure the fact that it had dinosaurs in it helped too. Dinosaurs have always been cool, but most 90s kids would agree that they were having a moment in the decade. And what young gamer is going to be able to resist a game cover showing some dude having a hand-to-hand -hand fight with a freaking raptor? Turok's success would launch a popular gaming franchise, with several sequels and even a reboot releasing in subsequent years. However, the lukewarm reception of later entries would lead the series to become dormant. That is until 2015, when Night Dive Studios remastered the original game for modern hardware, the version we are taking a look at today, with the remaster of Turok 2 following a few years later. The first thing you need to know about Turok is that it's not a name, it's a title. Passed down from generation to generation, the Turok is charged with protecting the barrier between Earth and the Lost Land, a primitive world where time is not a factor, inhabited by fearsome creatures, dinosaurs of course, but also technologically advanced aliens. You play as Tal Set, a Native American time-traveling warrior and current holder of the Turok mantle. An evil overlord called the Campaigner is on a mission to recover an ancient weapon known known as the Chrono Scepter. If the campaigner gets his hands on the Chrono Scepter, he will use its devastating power to rule the universe. And it's up to Tal Set, the Turok, to find the Chrono Scepter first and defeat the campaigner once and for all. And that's about as much of the story as I was able to glean from the internet. Yeah, Turok is not too concerned with telling a story. Not many cutscenes in this one, or even a basic rundown of the plot. This was back in a time where it was up to the game's manual to provide this type of information. The game pretty much throws you right in and tells you to get going. Who needs story when we have dinos to kill and bugs to stab? Turok features eight levels accessible through a hub world. To progress to the other levels, you have to activate their portals. And to do that, you have to collect the keys for them, which are hidden throughout the game. And just so you know, Talset absolutely loves finding keys. Look at that face. He's stoked. <sighs> Hunting down these keys means Turok puts a big emphasis on exploration. Turok takes a semi-non-linear approach to its level design. It's like a playground, a big prehistoric playground, giving the player a sprawling, twisting map with branching paths and plenty of room for activities. Activities like jumping, swimming, and climbing. And we can't forget the switch puzzles. Nothing makes me feel more productive like standing on a big stone square that opens some random thing. 
Indeed, Turok's levels do a great job of keeping things interesting. One moment you're zooming through narrow canyons, getting blindsided by raptors, the next running around an arena of crumbling buildings, trading shots with barbarian mercenaries, or diving into underwater tunnels you discovered at the bottom of a pool. You even have to watch out for the occasional trap, like these spiked tree branches that I assume were set up by someone who wasn't hugged as a child. All we need now is a giant talking stone head and we have a hardcore version of Legends of the Hidden Temple. The choices are yours and yours alone. Something that makes exploration awesome in this game is the abundance of secrets. There is something so fun about randomly looking over a cliff and seeing a narrow ledge underneath that leads to some hidden goodies. Or spotting the tiniest gap out of the corner of your eye that leads into a series of tunnels. Secrets were commonplace in mid 90s shooters, but in Turok, they're a core aspect of the experience. A good chunk of the secrets are mandatory, as that's how you'll find some of the keys as well as the pieces of the Chrono Scepter, which we'll talk about a little later. Turok's levels are truly designed to be played multiple times. The first time you'll likely blow through these stages like an asteroid with nothing but extinction on the mind. The next time though, you'll comb through them and likely stumble upon a whole new section of the level full of enemies and obstacles with a fitting prize at the end. It never stopped being surprising and it was always satisfying. <laughs> There's also special challenge rooms spread throughout each level, accessible by these blue portals that open up at time intervals. The challenge rooms are platforming obstacle courses, sometimes featuring enemies, but usually a lot of narrow ledges and traps. They can be tricky to complete, however, you can reattempt them as many times as you want without consequence. They're fun, varied, and do a nice job of breaking up the main gameplay. Turok might have more in common with Mario 64 than Doom. Platforming takes center stage in this game, which was a pretty notable thing for the time as not a lot of shooters featured platforming. Turok is chock full of treacherous jumping on narrow platforms, sometimes moving, sometimes timed, and they are laced cleanly throughout its roamable levels. It was kind of a ballsy choice to make the game this way when you think about it. It was hard to make platforming work in an FPS back then. Hell, it was hard to make platforming work in a 3D game in general, and obviously the FPS genre doesn't naturally lend itself itself to precise platforming due to its camera. And if we're being honest here, it didn't necessarily work perfectly for the original N64 version. Turok's platforming was something many were critical of due to the limitations of the N64 controller. But in this remastered form on mouse and keyboard, the platforming works beautifully, especially since there's a good amount of coyote time to help you out. That's where the game gives you a little extra room past the ledge to make your jump. It's still not flawless. There's still times where it's a little hard to judge your distances, and sometimes not being able to see your feet does lead to some accidental deaths, made worse by the fact that there's a live system. A mistimed jump or accidental fall will cost you a precious life, and some of the platforming sections in this game are just plain mean, with ledges spread far apart from each other or enemies literally dropping from the sky right where you need to land. It's not as big of a deal on the normal difficulty, as eventually you'll be pretty stocked up on lives in general, but on hard and hardcore, where lives are more scarce and deaths are more common, it can be pretty crushing. Ah yes, the live system. In Turok, you can hold up to nine lives, and when you die, you return to the last checkpoint. Lose all your lives, and you'll have to reload back at the last save point. To earn lives, you have to collect these floaty triangle thingies, which are dispersed throughout each level, giving you more of an excuse to explore and be silly. Collect a hundred of them, and you'll earn a new life, and our hero will remind us who he is. I am Turok! You sure are, buddy. It's pretty much the same idea as collecting 100 coins in Mario or 100 Wampa Fruit in Crash. Once again, the platformer DNA in this game is very apparent. I'll be honest, I did groan a little seeing that there were fixed saves and a live system when I first played this game. But in Turok's case, you have ample checkpoints, and if you do run out of lives, the save points are typically in pretty fair spots. And in truth, if you focus on exploring and gobbling up all those triangles, you'll be rewarded with plenty of lives, which gives me another excuse to compliment the extra exploration. The best part about exploring is that you're always rewarded for it, whether it be ammo, weapons, health, or something with a little more kick. The devs were very good about giving you a nice little drip of dopamine for your efforts. For this remaster, Night Dive did an excellent job of preserving the original look of the game while modernizing and optimizing appropriately. The game supports high resolutions, FXAA anti-aliasing, anastrophic filtering, and all the usual fixins, with some simple shadows, water reflections, and light scatter thrown in to sweeten things up. 
One thing to note about the original Turok was its heavy use of fog, done to keep the game's performance at an acceptable level. Now, while the fog is still present, the draw distance has been expanded greatly to reveal more of the environment to the player. And if you're wondering why the fog was left in at all, well, if we turn it off in the console, that's why. I mean, it was the N64. Gotta cut corners somewhere. It's the best this 24-year-old N64 game has ever looked. However, it still looks like a 24-year-old N64 game. All right, right off the bat, let me say that I applaud the way Turok's levels look. In a time where rendering outdoor environments in 3D was a challenge, Iguana managed to make the player feel like they were truly in a jungle environment. A jungle environment with some big stone walls, mind you, but an effective jungle environment nonetheless. And for the time, Turok was a visual stunner for a home console game. That being said, by today's standards, these maps are looking pretty simplistic and samey, as many of the textures and certain level geometry is repeated throughout. Yep, there's a total of two textures in this area. Neat. To be fair, many 3D games of this era haven't held up very well visually, and Turok has aged better than most. But for some players coming into this game new, it might take a little bit to adjust to Turok's retro splendor. That's not to say there weren't graphical touches I appreciated. The enemies are animated rather smoothly and have some pretty blood-curdling death animations. <laughs> Nothing but family entertainment here at Kirk Collects. A favorite of mine is taking down the sizable Perlin enemies who tumble forward and shake the ground under their weight. And if they happen to hit you, you'll take damage, which is a nice touch. The particle effects for guns and gore also look great and still have that fuzzy N64 look to them, which made me feel all sorts of nostalgic. Also, I love the beams of sunlight coming from the sky. A part of me does wish Night Dive went in and improved some of the textures and models, but hey, the effort here is impressive nonetheless, and like I said, this is the best that Turok has ever looked. For audio, this remaster features both the N64 and PC versions of the music, so whether you're a purist or love better fidelity, this game has you covered. Turok's music fits this game like a blood-stained glove. It has this savage, primal feel to it, like you're rushing into battle, covered in war paint with spear in hand. A real nice touch is that the music will change whenever you enter a specific area. For example, whenever you dive underwater, the game switches to a calmer underwater theme. <laughs> My only complaint is that I wish the game featured a cleaned up version of the sound effects, which still sound like the compressed, low quality N64 versions. This might not have been possible for Night Dive to fix, as the original source versions of these effects might have been lost, but it is something to note. Mechanically, I think Turok has aged well like a fine wine. It starts with the basic movement, the foundation of what makes this game so enjoyable. Tal's set is fast as hell, and when he turns, the camera tilts slightly, making you feel like you're a rocket gliding through the air. It's smooth and responsive, but where movement makes you feel like a feather on the wind, combat will make you feel like a brick smashing through a window. Turok's shooting mechanics remain rock solid, with the kind of satisfying punch that has kept me and many others coming back to this style of game over and over. If the weapons don't clobber, like the shells from the shotgun, they slice, like the barrage of bullets from the minigun. Before I knew it, I was charging through these levels in a dinosaur blood frenzy, circle strafing these beasts into extinction, and jumping around like a five-year-old hopped up on fun dip. Enemies usually have a few weapons that they are particularly weak against, giving the player some combat options. For example, raptors are best dealt with with shotguns or the tech bow. Whereas the cybernetic enemies towards the end of the game are easier to kill with energy weapons or explosives. What bugged me about combat though is that there are plenty of hit scanning enemies in this game. And since these levels can be pretty wide and open, you're gonna find yourself in that situation where you're getting peppered by bullets and have no idea where they're coming from. Nothing says fun like getting hit by bullets you can't dodge from clear across the map. Turok also features some wonderfully random bullet spongy boss fights. Why random, you ask? Well, the first boss is against a pair of silver humbies remote controlled by this burly hunter guy, and the second is against a giant praying mantis, with the final boss against Shao Kahn from Mortal Kombat. Okay, it's not Shao Kahn, it's the campaigner. But I mean, look at him. Come on. 
The only boss fight that was closest to on brand was against the robot T-Rex. The boss fights are actually pretty decent in this game. The only one I disliked was against the Humvees, as the whole fight I was basically circle strafing around them and pumping a steady stream of bullets into their asses. Not terribly exciting. The Mantis fight though was pretty awesome. He's an aggressive bugger that likes to spit acid all over the place. Partway through the fight though, it will start raging out and destroying the walls of the arena, expanding it, which I thought was pretty spectacular. And the T-Rex might as well be wearing square pants, because it's the biggest sponge of them all. Yeah, you're gonna use up all your ammo in this fight. However, its aggressive attack patterns kept me on my feet, so I can't say I ever got bored. And Shao Kahn Campaigner can actually be taken down rather quickly. I'm not critical of this though, and I'll tell you why in a second. Turok features a pretty meaty arsenal, 14 weapons total in fact, more if you count the alternate ammo types. You start with a knife and a pistol and eventually get a shotgun, which behave pretty much as you'd expect. Not much to really note here other than the shotgun having a ridiculous amount of range. Felt a little unfair to me to be honest, but I ain't complaining. But then you also start out with the tech bow, the iconic weapon of Turok. With standard arrows, it's not terribly powerful. However, when you collect the tech arrows, that's when this puppy really shines, exploding enemies in a puff of blue death. The only other weapon in the game to have an alternate ammo type is the shotgun, which can be equipped with explosive shells, invaluable against the stronger enemy types. I do have one complaint about the different ammo types though, and it's that you don't have the ability to switch them out. So for example, if you wanted to save your explosive shells for a stronger enemy and just use your normal ones, you can't. If you have explosive shells, you're forced to use them. Same with the tech bow. It's an irksome and unnecessary limitation of your arsenal, and I'm a little surprised functionality for this wasn't added to the remaster. Before long, the player gets the Assault Rifle, my go-to weapon for the lesser enemy types and great for distance killing, as well as the automatic shotgun, which is self-explanatory. Eventually you get the Pulse Rifle, which is a beast. Requiring energy ammo, this is a wonderful tool against the stronger enemy types. Next is the minigun, fires rapidly and melts all that stands before it. I love this thing. Always love a good minigun, in fact. And then you have some explosive fare, a grenade launcher that has just the right amount of arc. And even if you're a little short, the grenades will slide on the ground right before exploding. It's perfect. And then there's the missile launcher that shoots four rockets at a time, making me smile ear to ear. But of course, there's also the BFG, or rather the first BFG of the game, the fusion cannon, which fires a devastating nuclear ball. Oh, no, 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 nothing surviving that. Now, this group of weapons here covers all the bases, more than covers them. But then the game also gives you the alien weapon. Drawing from the energy ammo pool, this fires a green ball that has a delayed explosion, which can send enemies flying into the air. Then there's the particle accelerator. When charged up, this bad boy disintegrates enemies' atomic structure and causes them to explode. Now, to be honest, I didn't think these weapons were totally necessary, but I didn't mind having them either. In truth, I preferred the pulse rifle as my energy weapon, as it's a lot more versatile. But then of course, there's one last weapon we still need to talk about. The big overall objective in Turok is to find the ultimate BFG of the game, the Chrono Scepter. The Chrono Scepter is broken up into eight parts scattered throughout Turok's eight levels, and most are not easy to find. You really have to be exploring intensely to come across them. If you manage to assemble it, you can kill Shao Kahn Campaigner in three shots. Yes, three shots. You can take him on without it, but obviously the fight will be much more difficult. Remember earlier when I said that Turok always rewards the player for exploration? Well, that's what I love about the Chrono Scepter. If the player puts the full amount of time into one of the best aspects of the game, they will be rewarded handsomely, which I think is pretty damn cool. And if they don't find the Chrono Scepter the first time around, they now have a great excuse to replay this banger of a shooter. Before we wrap up, I want to touch on the game's difficulty. Turok features the standard easy, normal, and hard modes, with a hardcore mode added in by Night Dive for the real pros out there. I started the game on hard and initially was having a good time with it. On hard mode, enemies are tougher and more accurate, and it was giving me quite the challenge. However, after completing the first four levels, I dipped the game down to normal. Why? 
Well, here's the thing. In Turok, the enemies eventually respawn after you kill them, which isn't a bad thing. It keeps the player on their toes while they're exploring, and enemies commonly drop health and ammo when you kill them. But on hard mode, the enemies respawn faster, and they don't drop anything upon death. No ammo, no health, nothing. The problem? Well, since the enemies are respawning faster and don't drop any ammo upon death, and the level pickups are limited and don't respawn, I found myself exhausting my ammo often and having to rely on my knife, which was frustrating. It got to the point where I had to resort to just running through the levels and only focusing on enemies that could hitscan me. Any enemy that used melee, I would just ignore. At this point, I felt like I wasn't experiencing the game as intended, and I was tired of running around with my knife. But when I lowered the difficulty to normal, the game was a little too easy. Before I knew it, my lives were totally maxed and my ammo was abundant. Of course, everyone's skill level is different, this isn't necessarily an issue for all players, but for me personally, the difficulty never felt quite right, and it was disappointing. The game was still heaps of fun, but I do wish the difficulty settings were more thought out. Has Turok held up? Look, the N64 original is one thing, but this remastered version is a hell of a good time. Despite my gripe with the difficulty and the graphics looking pretty crusty, I think this is a timeless and important shooter that should be on the must-play list for anyone that fancies themselves a fan of old-school shooters. But hey, that's just my opinion. What do you guys think of Turok? Anybody have any memories of playing this back in the day? Anybody thinks this deserves a revival? Let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to subscribe, like, and ring the bell for notifications on future videos. It's a massive help for this channel. Also, be sure to check out the Kirk Collects Discord linked in the description below. I'm Kirk, and thank you for watching this video. Stay safe out there.